In today's tutorial, I'll be going over how you can make an insulated tubing texture trim. Specifically, we'll be making a single texture trim sheet here. Not the entire actual trim sheet, but just one of the trims here. Once you see how I've made one of those, it'll become very easy to know how to make the other alternatives here. I'll be using Blender for doing the modeling and, of course, Substance Designer. But the one special piece of software I haven't used in this tutorial series yet is Marvelous Designer. Marvelous Designer is a piece of software for doing cloth simulation, and that's how I got all these wrinkles and folds and insulated look to it. You can pick up a free 30-day trial of Marvel Design from their website before you purchase it. But the nice thing I liked about Marvel Designer is that once you do purchase it, you own it for life, though you can also rent it. So without further ado, let's get started. So I'm inside a blank blender scene here. I've already turned my viewport just a little bit by collapsing the bottom to give me more room. The first thing we need to figure out before we can create our tube texture is how big it's going to be on the texture sheet and how we're going to plan to bake it and tile it out. So we're basically going to be making a 3D model and then baking it. So you can see these long tube textures here. If I scroll onto the trim sheet here, we can see on this trim sheet, for example, we have a total of five texture trims. So we have these three here on the left and then these two. And so what you notice, if we imagine this as the zero to one space, which it is on the plane, these take up one fourth of the texture sheet and then these take up one eighth. So both of these together are another one fourth. So we can already know we can divide a plane into four sizes here and that's how big one of these needs to be baked out to. So let's go back into Blender and let's add a plane. And then I'm going to UV unwrap this real quick. So I'm going to open up a new window, go to the UV image editor, the tab. And I already UV unwrapped it because by default I have a mode turned on to where it'll UV unwrap it. Let me show you that real quick. If I spawn then again, I have generate UVs turned on, which will automatically place the UVs. So now if I hit Control R to add some loop cuts, I can divide this into four equal size sections. So we know that this is one fourth in how big our sheet needs to be. So I want to have this down in the center though, because I didn't actually model these out onto one big area all of them together and then bake it out. I just made one at a time, then add them together inside Substance Designer. So let's just make one. So I'm going to cut here and here. Then I'm going to go to edge select mode and dissolve these. All right. And then I can delete these two on the side. And so now I know that's how much space just one of these textures will take up. And this is what it looks like in the 3D view when it's light out perfectly flat. But I need to wrap this into a tube. So first I'm going to subdivide this quite a bit and then I'm going to add the simple deform modifier. And I'm going to close this over here to give a little more room. And I want to turn the bend option on, but you notice it's been the wrong way. So if I go into edit mode first and then rotate by 90, we can see that it's bending the correct way. So I'm gonna type 360, all right. And then I'm going to rotate it back, but I'm not going to do an edit mode this time. All right, so now we have a view where we can see what our 2D UV space looks like in 3D when wrapped in a tube. So something interesting I always find out about this is when you take any texture flat here, and it looks pretty large, but once you wrap it into a tube, it's actually pretty skinny. So that's something to think about whenever you're making a tube type texture or something like tree bark. So what we're gonna want to do now that we have this tube and it's mapped to a UV space is we can just build our insulated tube texture inside here as a 3D model. Then when we bake it out to this model here, it'll place it inside here. So we've already got this mapped out. I'm going to actually hit apply here on that and I'm going to move its origin to the very center. So if I hit shift control alt c I'm going to do origin to geometry and now I know the origin is perfectly in the center of this model. If I can hit shift control or shift s and then do cursor or selection to cursor right 
And one other thing I'm going to do here, which will make more sense in the future when we go to the Marvel Designer, is I'm going to hit G, then Z, Control, and snap it up by one unit. So now I have this above the plane here. And that's because in Marvel's Designer, by default, if I were to import this, it'd be clipping into the ground, and the ground has collisions when I'm doing the cloth simulation. You can move things in Marvel's Designer, but I find it more consistent if I just move it in the bottom room. So every time I need to re-export for whatever reason, it's in the perfect spot. So one other thing I'm going to do with this model real quick is these edges here are actually not joined in the 3D view. So I need to remove doubles and that removed two of the vertices. So now this is perfectly looped. And if I have this option on the UV editor, keep UV in edit mode, mesh selection, sync, I can kind of see where the edge seam is. So this is directly in the center and these, so this one's on the edges here. All right. So the other thing about these tube textures here is I have these rings going across them. So when they're mapped in 3D, it counts that there's these metal joint rings in between them, kind of keep them together. And that's going to become really in handy for us because we actually just need to model one fourth of this. Then we can duplicate it, move it up, rotate it, duplicate it, move it up, rotate it, and so forth. And you won't be able to easily pick out that these are actually the same sections here. They've been rotated 180 degrees another way, then shifted over. So we can duplicate this model. And I'm going to move this up real quick to layer one. And then I'm going to divide this out. So one, two, and then three. So now I can look at this and know that I just need to make one of these sections here. So what I think I will do is go ahead and move this over. And I know that this is two units long. So these two together are one unit, which means this is 0.5 units. So I'm going to shift this forward by 0.25 units. So G, Y, 0.25. And that's because I just want one of these sections here directly in the center, and it is. So I'm going to select that section, then hit Control I, and then delete these faces. So now I know I just need to make one of these. And I'm going to duplicate this again, except this time I'm going to delete another set over here. And I'm going to take this and I'm going to subdivide it. And then I'm going to add a skin modifier. And this will serve as kind of one of our rings. That's way too big. So let's make sure we apply our rotation and scale. And then let's go to our skin modifier here. And I believe we need to reset where our origin point is on this. So let's go into Edmo and click one of these vertices. And this is on just a single ring here. I'm going to hit mark root. And it might have already had the remark, but I'm going to select the entire thing, then hit control A, and then scale this down. So control A is what you'll use to scale this down. And you can also see these things for scale over here while I'm moving that around. So it's the mean radius option here on this tab. Let's close all these. And then I'm going to add one more subsurf modifier. And you can hit control one or two on your keyboard to add subsurface modifiers. So if you already have one, it will just change that one. Then you go back over here, then add subdivision surface again. And now I have a ring of sorts. All right, let's subdivide just one more. And I like how that looks. And then I'm gonna subdivide this too. So I can just hit control two. All right. And now for this, I'm going to add an array modifier to take off relative offsets at the constant and then move it forward by 0.25 or by 0.5 rather it seems. All right, so next I'm going to adjust this just a little bit more. I want this to be a little bit skinnier. And I like how that looks. So now we've got a good basis for how one of these model sections need to be. So I need to have these tubes on the inside and then the cloth simulation will go on top of these tubes. So in the next section, I'll go into how I place those tubes inside here. 
So we're ready to start placing our other tubes inside here that we're going to shrink wrap to. You don't have to do tubes, you can kind of do any geometry you want to. But I like the tube design a lot because it looks really cool once there's cloth shrink wrapped on top. So let's go over here to layer two and I'm going to go ahead and change the setting up here to make sure only the layer that's shown is visible. So we go to the very top, I can change this to visible layers. Now on the hierarchy, it's only showing me what's on this layer. So if I go back to number one, I can see that I have two plain objects here. And I should really rename these. So I'm going to call these the rings. And then I'm going to call this just the tube underscore ref. Because this isn't the extra tube we're going to be baking to. We're going to be baking to the very long one over here. All right. Now let's go back to layer two here, and let's go and place down a path curve. So we go to curves and the paths, and go into edit mode here, we now have a path. I'm gonna go and hit G, then X, and control. Snap this over, then I'm gonna rotate it on Z by 90. And you notice I have the pivot on the 3D cursor. If you had just a medium point, it would have rotated in the long, wrong area. All right, so now we have this path rotated here, and I have it positioned in such a way to when I spawn a new object here, their origins be directly on top and it can array across the path. So let's go ahead and add a circle. I'm gonna to go to mesh circle and check its settings. And I have it set to 12 vertices here. I'm keeping it low and I'm gonna set it more on export, but I don't wanna to go too crazy high because Marvel designer can get a bit upset if your models are just way too high in polygon count. So let's go ahead and go into edit mode on here and then rotate this upon X by 90. Then let's scale it down to about what we think the size should be of our tube here. And I'm gonna hold down shift and click back on the first one to see how big this should be. So quite a bit smaller. Now just remember the smaller you do, the more you're going to need to place in here to fill up all around. But you shouldn't have to do that many. So I think about here, here is a good size. Let's just go back to over here. Now I'm going to extrude this just a little bit upon Y, and then I'm going to add my array modifier. Now I'm gonna keep it relative path this time, as I can go back and edit this some. So now it's going just by one, and I'm gonna turn on merge, so these merge the vertices together as they array. So I'm gonna change the fit type from fixed count to fit curve. And just select our curve here. I'm also going to rename these. I'm going to call this tube or curve tube 01. And then I'm going to call this curve tube mesh mesh 01. And then I'm going to put all of these inside and empty. Because I'm going to be duplicating this entire structure several times. And it's good to know which mesh belongs with which curve. So if we hit shift A, we can then go down to empty and just add say a plane axis. I'm going to call this tube zero one. So let's drag these in here. And now this entire system is together and I can open this up and close it for organization too. All right. So something I like about this is I can go back and edit my tube quite a bit. So I had a loop cut here and then expand this. You can see it's in this entire tube here. So I'm gonna open this up some here to kind of give this graded pattern across the tube. And then if I hit control three for subdivision three, I'm gonna actually put that down to two. I can see how this looks. I think I want these inner parts to be creased a little bit more. So I'm gonna hit control R here. And Actually, I'm going to make sure these are perfectly even on both sides. So I'm going to select here, hit Control-B to bevel, then up that once by three by moving the scroll wheel up, and then make sure it doesn't taper it here. I can change the profile by hitting P. And now I can move my mouse back and forth here to change the profile. So I'm going to move it all the way to the right here and make sure it's sharp. And then when I tap P again, I can just move this some more. Let's put it about right there. And that's more of the tube structure I'm going for here. All right. So now that we have this in place, we can grab our path here. 
and not the empty. There we go, grab the path. And now as we edit this, I need to, let's see, unselect everything, All right? They can be a bit hard to see sometimes. I can move it around, we can see it's not stepping to it next. That's because I need to add my curve modifier now. So let's turn off the subsurf here real quick and put the curve modifier before that. So it goes through the whole process, then it subdivides. So if we go into select object, we only have one curve here right now. So you can select it that way. And it's going the wrong way. We need to set this to Y since it's going on the top of the Y axis. So now if we select our tube here, our path here and then edit it, we now see it is snapping to the path, which is perfect. All right. So let's go back over to here and then grab our path and start moving it. We already have the path selected. So I'm going to just move this up and scale it. And I'm going to turn the pivot off to medium point. And let's see here. And I think I'm going to shrink this down just a little bit more. So I'm going to select it and go into edit mode. Hit scale, shift Y. Actually just scale. All right. And actually, I want to scale upon the 3D cursor because it kind of stays in the same spot. There we go. And it looks like something kind of odd is going on about it. Why is that happening? Ah, I know exactly where that's happening. That's because of the merge distance here. Because it's so small now, the distance between them are also smaller. Let's put this 2.001. There we go. Now we're making sure only the correct points are actually matching. Let's subdivide just to be sure. All right. So I'm going to select this mesh here and then go to the object tab here. And I'm going to change the max draw type to be wireframe. And so now no matter what, this will be in wireframe so we can more easily see inside here. I'm going to reset the path and make sure you never move your path while inside object mode or otherwise it will be desync because the path and the mesh need to make sure their origins stay in the exact same place. So I was going to edit mode. Okay. So I want this to be right about inside here. And we're getting some clipping here. We have the camera set close. So if I go into hit in here, I can change the clip here. So I'm going to change this to 0 0.01. And now it shouldn't clip into my camera so easily. And this doesn't have to be perfectly inside it. We can kind of have it on top. So going in and out. Let's place that right here. Have this go here. Then I'm going to want these to be kind of looping around. And I'm going to change my pivot back to medium point because it kind of moves a bit oddly when you have it set to that way. All right. So about here is good. So now I'm going to go back over to my other tab here and select everything and duplicate. But I'm not going to use Shift D to duplicate. I'm going to use Alt D. And I'll show in a moment here why that's important. So now to easy select things, I can go into here and select my new curve tube here. So I'm going to select just the path here on the second one. And then I can go into edit mode and move just that one. All right, and actually it looks like it may be setting it to the wrong curve. So let's check out the modifiers here. We can see what's going on. This is the curve 2001, curve 2.001. So why is the other one also hidden? What are you bound to? Let's see here. I'm not quite sure why this is happening should be keeping these in sync. Give me just a moment. All right, I figured out what the issue was. And it's good that I ran into this problem just in case some of you run into this issue too and don't know how to troubleshoot it. So I talked about how I use Alt-D to keep them linked and that caused an issue that I didn't realize had happened before. So when you link data, you're linking the vertex data and a bunch of other information between models. So they're separate objects, but they kind of, when you add the vertices, they stay synced. And it was doing that for the curve too, which I did not realize. 
So I'm going to show you how to edit the object data and rename it. So I select my tube here. I can go in here and rename this. So I'm going to call this tube underscore mesh. And now I'm going to select everything and hit this regular shift D. And I'm going to hit G and move the entire structure to the right, just so we can better see this. Now I can see this is using tube mesh, but this is using tube mesh.001. And I want these so that when I change, say, the model on this a little bit, that whatever I edit here, it also edits on that once so they're all in sync. So what we can do is go back to the second one here and then change this to just be tube mesh. So now they're both using the exact same object data, but they are different objects. So I go back over here now, I'm going to hit period to zoom in on this. I say select this and scale it down to be going inward. Now we can see after I hit tab, these are both the same. So that's very convenient. All right. So let's go ahead and move this entire structure back. GX and slide it back. And now I can open this up and select the curve here and easily move this around. Right there we go. And the issue was that it was linking the curves data. But since these were both the same curve, when I went to edit this one, it's editing the other one simultaneously, keeping directly on top, which we did not want. Okay. So I'm going to select these points here and move this, say, over here to the left. About right there. And then I want this one to kind of go up and around. I'm going to hit period again to zoom in, kind of focus my pivot. I want this to go like that. And we don't have to actually fill in every single gap here. It'll be covered up a little bit when we go in to Marvel's Designer. So I'm going to place this about right here. And I want this to kind of go down and up. Okay, All right, now I'll just go back to layer two here. And now I'm going to select this entire structure and hit shift D, again the duplicate. Then we can open it up and go to our mesh here and make sure we have two mesh selected again so that's in sync. Then just select the curve object here. Hit hold shift, go up to layer one, and we can edit this again. And I may just go ahead and fast forward through this process and jump ahead after I finish placing everything. So I don't think anything else too interesting is going to be happening while I'm kind of tediously placing this. So I think I'll cut and be right back. Okay, I finished placing my tubes how I think I want them. I have a total of five tubes here kind of going in around. And what we're gonna do is export out this mech structure in a moment here to Marvel's Designer. Then we're gonna shrink wrap it all around. Before I do that, I want to go over how it's okay to have these tubes kind of intersecting here and not all of them reach the end. So you can see I had a big blank area here, so I moved this tube around here, but I didn't want it to go all the way to the end. This didn't have quite that much room there or reason to. So it just stops right here. But no one's gonna be noticing that since it's gonna be wrapped up in cloth. So let's go over how to export this. So first I'm going to go over onto here, and this is the main structure I want to export out that I'll be shrink wrapping to. So I'm gonna save here real quick. I'm gonna select the entire structure with A, then go to File and Export, and I'm going to choose OBJ format. All right, and I'm gonna just export out here. I'm gonna do Selection Only, Apply Modifiers, and we could use the modifier render settings. Let's check our subdivisions on here real quick and see what they look like. We might be fine with it. We probably want to subdivide just a little bit more. Otherwise, the cloth will kind of flatten on these individual polygons. So let's close this and see what our render settings are at. All right. So let's increase this just once more on each of these. So actually, I'm going to select all of these, then just hit Control-3. Now they're all subdivided quite a bit more. All right, that's good. Now let's go back and do file export. So I'll export OBJ and selection only. 
and we don't need the modifier render settings, but we actually change them there in just the default settings. And I may also want to change my scale some, but before that, let's just go and export by default and then we can re-export if we need to. So let's do export OBJ. And this will give just a moment here why exports. And next I'll be in Marvel's designer for importing. We'll see you there. We're ready to move on to the Marvel's designer aspect of this tutorial. Now I'm in the default screen of Marvel's designer here. And the first thing I'm going to do is go to the upper left and go to file and then import and import OBJ. Then you're going to want to navigate to those pipes we exported. I'm going to hit open. And there's a few different options here. We're going to want to make sure we load this as an avatar and also change your scale from millimeters to meters. Blender units by default are meters. And everything else here should be good. So go ahead and OK. And if your model is pretty dense like ours are, then it may take a little while. And if things are really dense, it will have a lot of trouble with simulations. You want to try to make sure your model is relatively optimized, but still not too low poly where the polygons will show up in the simulation. All right, now that it's in, you see what looks like a large avatar here and a bunch of other information. We don't care about this for this tutorial. So let's go ahead and close this menu. And in the upper left here, if your avatar did not go away like mine, you see this little character here, the avatar display. If you go up to here, you can turn on these different aspects. So if yours is still on, go ahead and toggle these off. All right, so here are our pipes. Now what we're gonna to need to do here inside Marvel Designer to place our cloth more precisely is make sure we have our measurements down over here. The way Marvel Designer works is you draw out 2D patterns, which would be like fabric that's lied down flat. Then that gets converted over here into the 3D scene of where it's draped on, just like how real clothing is done. So if we go back to our blender scene here, we know that our pipes were two meters long and it was one fourth of a two meter by two meter plane, which means they are one meter by four meters. And this is a one fourth section of that large strip. So we basically need a piece of cloth that should be one meter by half a meter. I have that correctly. Let's go check our other pipes here just to make sure. All right, so let's head back in and let's go ahead and place a circle. So we know that one fourth of the two meter plane would be 0.5 meters. So what we're gonna want to do is place two piece circle pieces here at the end. And this will act as kind of where the rings are for our cloth to join to during the simulation. So on the right here, you wanna go to the top and click on the ellipse tool here. Then inside this 2D area over here, you just want to left click once. And then we have some options here to change the size of our cloth we're making. So let's go to circumference and change that to 0.5 meters or 500 millimeters. Then hit OK. And it's going to take just a second to load. Shouldn't be taking that long though. All right, there it is. And as you can see, it also placed it here into the 3D viewport. If you want to edit your object in the 3D viewport, you can first go over here to the right and select the select tool up here for transform pattern. And if you just click on your pattern here, it will automatically put a gizmo on it. You can also just left click in the blank over here, then click on it. And you'll notice though, if you just click over here, it places the pivot wherever you clicked. So if you want to have it to where the center of mass is, then you need to click over here and it places it directly at the center. And now we can move this around. So let's go ahead and move this up and place it kind of where the rings would be. We don't need to get it truly perfect, just close enough. All right. Move this down a little bit. And I think right about there. 
Now then, we need to place another circle on the opposite side here for our cloth to sit into, but we need to make sure they're the perfect distance apart. So it should be about one meter here, I believe, or maybe it was half a meter, but we'll figure out. So click your pattern over here and hit Control C, Control B, and now you can move up and down. So I'm gonna move it up while holding Shift, and I'm gonna left click just once. And actually, I believe I need to right click. Let's do Control C, Control P again, and then right click. Yeah, so if you right click, you then have the controls for how far you want to go. So I'm going to do 500. All right. And that looks about the correct distance for when this gets transformed down here. So I'm going to start by rotating this. And if you hold down Shift while rotating, it'll actually snap. So like that, and this bottom one, we need to rotate it also. We're gonna rotate it this way. All right. Now I'm going to click the top one, hold on shift and left click the next one and rotate the entire structure by 90 degrees. Okay. And then just re-click these and move it back into place. All right, and get it relatively precise. We want, we can go back in and take a look at where things were to get a little bit closer. I'm gonna go back into Blender real quick here and take a look at what I have. So the ring kind of goes past this pipe here. So let's go back to Marvel's Designer. And move it this way just a little bit. Either way, this should match up perfectly to our rings because these rings here we know are exactly one meter in circumference and our rings here are also perfectly one meter in circumference. So even if our rings in the simulation are a little bit higher, a little bit lower, the overall ring will still match up once it plugs in. And that's the part we really care about because we're basically using these rings to mask the joints between the patterns so we don't have to make a perfect tiling simulation. All right, and that looks good. Now, the next thing we need to do is place cloth in the center. So I did 500 meters up this way and 500 meters in circumference. So that means we need a 500 meter by 500 meter square to wrap around this tube. So I'm gonna go back to the right here and click our square or our rectangle tool, then just left click somewhere. And it defaults to 500 by 500 millimeters. Let's hit OK. It should give just a moment to process in place. It usually doesn't take it this long to place, but I think it's taking so long because my model is kind of high poly. All right. So let's move this shape down to make us some more room over here. All right. And then I'm going to move this to be kind of in the center and get as close as possible. There you are, that's close enough. So something we can do if things aren't perfectly in the center is we can right click our pattern here and then we can go to reset 2D arrangement and it will look at how it is in this 2D space over here and convert that over to the 3D scene. So that should be good. Now let's rotate this by 90 degrees or relatively close. It doesn't matter, we're about to do a simulation really. But I want to get this somewhat close. Then let's move this up and sort of above it. Okay. Now we just need to sew and then do the simulation. So the way sewing works inside Marvel's, Design, Marvel's Designer is you have these edges and edges can be sewed to other edges. You can see this square here has four edges and so do these. What we want is this bottom side, which is right here, to be connected around this ring and this top side to be connected around this ring. But because that's one edge to four edges, there's not enough edges here. So we need to add some more. At the very top here, you see this little plus button called add point slash split line. You can tap X to get to that quickly. Once I select that tool, I can then highlight these edges and place a split along it. To place a more precise split, right click. Now I'm gonna go down to the uniform split and up that to three. 
and you can see it previews in live in real time over here. So I'm going to put to four, to have four individual areas. And then I'm going to do the same thing down at the bottom. All right. Yes, that is correct. So now we're ready to sew these. To sew, you go right here to the second little sewing tube called segment sewing. And here's how sewing works. So I want to match this whole edge to around the corner here. So first I'm going to click on one of these edges. And it's important to see where that little bar is appearing on here because you want to make sure the bars match it to where they go. So if I click on that one, then this one, you can see how it's going to be making the sewing line there. If I click it, now we can see it in the 3D view how it's connected. And if I had said click this right side and then the other side down here, you can see it's twisting. And now I've got these seams going the wrong way. So make sure you have those lined up. Let's click there. Then on the other side, we'll do the same thing. Then these sides are going to wrap around to the other side. So I'm going to click there and then there. And this kind of looks like it's intersecting a little bit here. But if we were to rotate this around, it would be matching up. And it looks like it's thinking quite hard about it for some reason. All right, so that's matched up. Let's match this one up. So that's all sewn together over there. And we just need to do the top side. Let's click here, then here, here, then here, here, then the opposite side, then here, then the opposite side. Okay, so we're ready to do the simulation. But before we do that, I'm going to, I just noticed that this is clipping a little bit here, which I don't want. So I'm going to go back to transform over here, select both of my circles, then back to the 3D view, move it up just a tad. So there we are. That's probably a bit better. Maybe around there. Okay, I think I'm happy with that. So before we do our simulation, we want to make sure these just stay perfectly still as if they're frozen. In order to do that, you, while they're highlighted, you just right click one and then you go up to freeze. You can also use control K. To indicate that it's frozen, they turn blue. Now these won't do anything during the simulation. Now we just need to hit this play button up there. But first I'm gonna say before simulating. And all right, it's almost done. Okay, so let's go ahead and hit the simulation button up here. And as you can see, there's a loading bar for the draping, but after that, you can run this in relative real time. As you can move the camera around, it'll still be simulating. You can also click on the cloth and drag it around while it's simulating. It's quite fun to play with. So I'm going to go ahead and turn simulation off to do some more work on it. So you can see it did wrap around quite nicely, but there's still this large gap here. So let's go back over to the 2D viewport here, and then go to the sewing tool right here. Then click the top of this segment and the top of the opposite side. And now we can see we have a seam here. All right, so let's simulate this. And there we go. Now we have that close, but there's still kind of a line here. And I want it to be like it's a perfect shrinked wrap tube. To fix that, we're going to select this edit sewing button here. And now we can click on sewing segments. Like here, here, and here. So I click on this one here. We can go over here and we can see fold strength and fold angle. I'm going to reduce the sewing line type fold strength down to zero and the fold angle also down to zero. I'm also going to change the 3D seam line intensity to zero. Ooh, that went way too low. So I actually want you to just click here then type zero. There we are. And now if we hit play, we can see the seam is virtually gone. There's a little bit of a seam due to the normals. But other than that, this won't be noticeable in our bake. All right. On the next section here, I'll be playing around some more settings to change the fabric type in order to get to be more of a plastic shrink wrap feel. So now we're ready to refine our simulation properties to get this to look a very nice shrink wrap plastic. First, let's take a look at our wireframe of our mesh here that we're simulating. 
As you can see, it's not really that dense. We're gonna to need to make this a lot more fine in order to fit into these individual little tube ribs here. So I put that back to shade it up here. You can do that so in the upper left on this little blanket looking icon. So if we go over and click on our big square, you'll see on the right here, we have simulation properties. The one that affects how dense the mesh is, is particle distance. The smaller this number goes, the finer and more subdivided our mesh will be. Now you're going to want to make sure you don't put this down to a drastic number right away. I like to start with 10 and then go lower and lower. But the lower you go, the longer the simulation time will take and the laggier it'll be. So it's usually good to get a simulation you're happy with at around 10 properties or five. Then if you really want to go fine, you could go down to as low as one, but that can take a very long time to simulate. So you can see it just got a little bit smoother. If I go over to wireframe again, it's quite a bit denser. Not dense enough yet to really capture the ribs, but we're going to go smaller later once we get this more refined. So currently it's simulating just like a blanket. We want this to have pressure kind of sucking it inward, a negative pressure. Now, if we look over here onto the simulation properties, at the very bottom we have pressure. If I were to move this number up, then hit simulate, it's going to inflate outwards like a balloon. Now, you can actually tweak these while it's simulating. As long as this yellow arrow up here is highlighted, it's simulating. Let's go back up and move it to a negative number. So you can see as I drag this, it's now kind of shrink wrapping. So I'm gonna put that down to negative 70. And now it's kind of hugging it. If I want to add more wrinkles to this simulation, what I can do is go to the shrinkage weft and shrinkage warp. So currently they're at 100. I recommend moving these up and down in five intervals to kind of experiment with how to look. So I'm going to move this up by 105 and then move the shrinkage warp by 105. Now let's hit the simulation button again and see how this affects it. Not an extremely drastic change, but you can see a few more kind of wrinkles here appeared. Something I'm also going to do is change the fabric's physical properties. Currently, this is just a default fabric cloth, but we want something that behaves a bit more like plastic. So if we click the fabric over here, this is what is assigned to these cutouts here. And down here, there are physical property presets. I usually like to go down here and experiment with lots of different types. And I often don't choose the exact material to simulate. I like to have a bit more creative freedom. So sometimes I'll go down to something like Ponte Knit and see how that simulates. Usually some of these can fit a bit more into cracks. Silks usually often can stretch quite a bit. So if we look down here and go to one of these silks, and actually muslin and canvas, I remember, can get to very nice tight cracks. The simulation I do like. Let's turn the simulation off and make this finer once again by collecting our square here and then moving the particle distance down to five now. Hit enter and it will make it denser. Now it's simulated again. It's going to be a little bit finicky here, kind of jumping around. But this is getting close to how we kind of want our simulation to want look. I'm going to increase my shrinkage warp to 110 and see how that looks. Now we can see we just got quite a few more creases here. Once you're satisfied with a amount of kind of simulation you want and the amount of kind of seams you want, you can go even smaller. But let's try putting this down to 2.5. I usually just divide it in half each time. And it gives you a warning when you go down below five millimeters. So this can be quite beefy on your computer. So what I may do here is just keep going lower and lower on my simulation and then tab back to you guys once I have it to how I want it. So you can see just subdivide some more. Let's just hit play. Let's see how this looks. And it looks like it's really taking its toll on the computer. So what I'm gonna do is pause the simulation and mess with it just a little bit more and then I'll tab right back. All right, I spent some time messing around the simulation a little bit more and got this to a setting I really liked. 
If I click on my cloth, you can see the settings I used. I then should reduce my particle distance and the two, but I also changed my collision down from 2.5 to 0. This reduces the distance from the mesh on the inside that it collides with. You can only see there's a small space between your mesh and the actual cloth simulation. You can reduce distance further by actually scaling up your object, which I've done a few times, but the actual collision thickness will go down to zero. But even if it's at zero, there's still a very small gap between the mesh and your colliding source. That's something to keep in mind. Something else I did was re reduce the pressure back to zero after shrinking it some, and the shrink fish warp and shrink fish weft still kept it hugging on tight. I also clicked back on my fabric up here and changed the preset to R20's muslin. Something else we can see do the see this simulation a little bit better while inside Marvel's designer and has changed the material it is using. To do that, we can go over to the actual object here, and I believe it's actually on the material here. Uh, so right, if we go to the fabric over here and go down to type, we can change it from fabric matte to fabric shiny, silk, satin, velvet, whatever we want. So we put it on fabric shiny, you can see not much has happened. That's because the highlights are white and the cloth is white. Marvel's Iron doesn't do extremely accurate kind of PPR renderings of this. So we're going to change our color down so we can see the white highlights. Let's put this down to, say, a dark red, something like this, and hit OK. And now I can see this with a more of a plasticky look, similar to how our material is going to be. And I think I'm happy with how this looks. You can see there's a little bit of pinching here still, but we're going to fix that with a subdivision surface modifier inside Blender. Let's go ahead and save this. Save project. And then next what we're going to do is export out our mesh. We know that by just simply selecting the meshes we want to export in the 2D view here. We don't care about these circles, so I'm just going to click on my square over here. Then go to File, Export, OBJ, Selected. All right. So we have Insulated Tube Tutorial here. Is that what we want? Yes, it is. That's what I had put on. So I'm going to put this as insulated to MD export. And then underscore export. If I can put that correctly. All right. And hit save. Now it's going to ask what size to put it to. I would keep it the exact same as your import. Since I import as meters, I'm going to put that back to meters. The other thing you're going to want to do is put keep this on thin. If you have it on thick, it'll actually kind of solidify this mesh to where it has two sides, and that will be a lot of polygons. Everything else here is okay for now. Let's hit okay. And then I'll see you over back in Blender. All right, we're back inside Blender and we're ready to import. So I'm gonna go over to a new layer here and go to File, Import, OBJ, and then we're gonna select the mesh we just exported. Which is insulated to MD underscore export. And I'll set this to keep vertex order on. It may split it up to the different polygon groups, but it shouldn't do that for this. But I like to keep on and keep vertex order anyway. So we're going to do import OBJ, and we should get that model in. Here it is. And it's the same high up as it was before when we exported. Now we just need to construct our high poly model we'll bake from using this. And we're going to subdivide this some more to smooth it out a little bit. But first, let's go grab those rings, because they're going to be part of the high poly. So I'm going to select these and hit Shift-D, M, and then move them to this layer. Now, the next thing I want to make sure is that these are perfectly lined up with my 3D cursor here, and their origins are perfectly in the center of this ring. I'm going to move these down. So before I make sure those line up, I want to go back and check my rings here. So I believe I may have messed up and the origin is not in the correct spot. The origin should be directly in the center of this ring. I think it's actually a little bit off. So let's select this and then hit shift control alt C and then origin to geometry. And I don't believe modifiers affect it. So just to make sure I'm going to turn off all my modifiers to make sure it's truly in the center. So let's do shift control alt C origin to geometry. 
And yes, as we can see, this was mesh was actually a little bit lower than it should have been because the origin is slightly down. So let's go ahead and keep these in sync for now. And just select this, hit Shift S, and then do selection to cursor. Now it's at the correct height. So I just need to do GY and then slide it back and do negative 0.25. And now I can turn everything back on. All right. And then I can just left click and drag down to collapse all these to keep them hidden. And we can see our high poly from MD, not our high poly, our simulation from MD doesn't match up perfectly this ring quite right. And like I said, it wasn't exactly designed to do truly precise simulations. We're trying to get this accurate, but we can just move it up and then scale it some. So I'm going to get it in kind of ballpark range here, and then I'm going to do some scaling. And I'm going to scale upon the 3D cursor. So first thing I'm going to do is I want to hit scale and then shift Y. So it's scaling upon X and Z, but not Y. Let's shrink this a bit. See how that looks all around. It's going a bit far into it, so let's scale on Y. So about here should work. Now do shift scale Y again. And I'm going to subdivide this some more. So I'm put that down to two, then three. That's much more round. Let's do scale upon shift Y again. And then let's go to a side view and see how far these are clipping inward. So I think these are about at the correct spots here. Now we remember when we're baking here, it's only going to be looking inwards. It's not going to be seen from the sides or anything like that. So we're picking to a flat texture. So if things aren't quite right from this angle, we don't need to really worry about that too much since it won't be in the bake. There are little things like this I don't want clipping too far out. So I'm going to scale this a little bit more upon Shift Y, so X and Z. All right. And that should be much better. And then I'm going to move this up. So that these are all kind of around the center here. That does look about right. Almost. Maybe it scales one shift Y some more again, but then move it up. So I think we're in about ballpark range there. All right, let me check the other side here. This looks about right. And I'm going to rotate this on Y on the 3D cursor just to make sure I can spin this around smoothly. OK, perfect. The spinning is going to be important here. I'm going to hit Shift Control Alt C and put the origin to 3D cursor. And make sure this origin is also in the center here. So now their origins are directly on the same plane gone along the Y axis. So you notice this tube is much smaller than the tube we're going to be baking to here. Let me go ahead and just move this below it. So our high poly is above and our low poly is below. Let's move this down. I want to make sure this is also lined up just about perfectly. And this one also has the same issue, the origin being a bit small. Something I must have messed up on at the very beginning. So let's do origin to geometry again. Origin to geometry, then shift S selection to cursor. And now it's at kind of the perfect position for baking. So let's just keep our high poly tab on. So what we're going to do is duplicate this. The reason we didn't simulate the entire size of the pipe texture is that would be a lot of work and a lot of simulation time. This is just quicker and easier to do. And we're gonna do some tricks here to make sure it doesn't look like it's repeating. So it will look just as good if we were simulating them each individually. So I'm going to grab these marks here and grab the whole structure and then do G, Y, and it should be 0.75. Let's do it in negative. All right, and now I'm going to increase the rate of the metal band that will kind of hold the tube together. Let's put it up to five. And then we just need to have this fill in the other slots here. So if I hit Shift D, Y, then 0.5, hit Enter, then hit Shift R for repeat, we can see that now how it's all replaced. You notice how I was testing to make sure it rotated correctly. 
That's basically what I'm going to do now is select this third one and rotate it upon Y. I want to do this upon the origin. Let's just rotate that and make sure it's still all matching up on the long grain, which it should be. All right, that's good. So let's rotate this some more. So I'm good about there. For these other two, I'm also going to hit R, Z, and do a 180 on them to turn them around. And now I'm going to rotate the sum on Y. So I'm going to put this up to here. That looks good to me. So now we can't really see that these have some of the same elements here. They've all kind of been mixed and matched. Let's see, is that the same element? No, actually, yes, it is. So let's rotate this one some more on Y too. Let's put it to about right here. And that looks good. I can't see any more of the same elements that easily anymore. It's going to be our goal from our baking them. We don't want anyone to see the tube in game and seem like the same segment over and over. So this gives a bit better diversity. And it also looks like everything else here is matching up relatively well from the outside perspective. All right, that looks good. So let's go ahead and select our two first tube here and add a modifier to subdivide this and make it smooth. Let's add subdivision surface. And this is already a pretty dense mesh. So let's add one and I'll subdivide it again on export. What I'll do is select all these other meshes here, then hit Control L, and then link the modifiers. So Control L and then modifiers, and it'll link the modifiers from the first one. It's not an actual true link. I can still edit the modifiers individually. This is looking much better. All right, let's go back and check out our low poly here. Let's go open up the UV editor to make sure it still has its UVs in place. So UV image editor, hit tab, and it is. We're also going to subdivide this one quite a bit. And I'm going to add just a bit more geometry to have this more square for when we do the baking. It's kind of a nice even baking mesh. All right. I'm going to survive that just once more to be three. So it's a pretty dense and round mesh. And that looks good to me. Now let's hold down shift and open up our other tab here. And that should bake relatively fine. I may scale my baking mesh down a little bit, but I think this will work out for our bake. The only other thing we need to really do here is add in our materials and do a little bit more cleanup. So I'm going to go here and check the material on that. And this already has all the same material on it. So to export these out from Marvel Designer, what we're gonna do is change the material on the metal ring. So we're gonna bake out a matte ID for us to work with. So I'm gonna just add in a new material here and type metal underscore ring. Though our naming really doesn't matter for this. All right. Now we should be about ready for baking. So in the next segment, I'll be doing a little bit more cleanup than exporting these for the bake, and then we will almost be done. Before we do our export, there's a few things that were bothering me with the simulation here, and that's these harsh pinches I've had on the insides here. If we subdivide these by two, which will take a moment for the calculate, you can see the kind of pinching points here are pretty harsh. I had mentioned that we were going to smooth these out. The way we're going to do this is I'm first going to reduce this back to one so it's quick to work with. I want to keep the render at two. So when I export, I'm going to choose the render options. Next, I'm going to do add modifier and then go down to smooth. And I'll take a moment to place that. I'm going to move that up. Let's move that up. And the factor is currently at 0.5 and I'm going to change that to one. And that should smooth these points out quite a bit. So now they aren't quite as harsh. And if I subdivide that just once more on the subsurf, we won't get that kind of weird little hole effect they were getting in between. So that looks much more appropriate to me. So now we just need to select all of these over here and copy it. So first I'm gonna put this back down to one so it doesn't get too laggy when I copy it. So that down to one, let's select these by holding shift. Then the last one hit control L, link modifiers. Now all of these will be a bit smoother and have that reduced pinching. 
All right. So let me just subdivide this once more so to check it and make sure it's something I'm happy with. All right. And it looks like we have a seam here, which I didn't notice. And that is because the vertices are not merged. So if I turn off the subsurf here and the smooth, you can see those are directly on top, but they're actually separate vertices right on the sharp line here. That's why we're the select one I can move in. So we need to fix that real quick. So let's select it, hit A, then T, and then remove doubles. So it's probably gonna remove a lot more than what we want, maybe. And actually, no, it looks like it picked out all the correct ones. Let's go ahead and turn that back on. If it were to choose a lot more, you could just reduce the number lower and lower until it looks right. And we can also see it's marked sharp right now, so it has sharp shading, or it did. Let's see. So if we go back into edit mode, which will take just a moment since we had our modifiers back on, that blue line indicates or something is marked sharp. So I'm going to select all of that and hit Control E and hit clear seam. And then I'm going to hit clear sharp just to make sure. So clear sharp, we actually don't need to do clear seam because there isn't a UV seam there. So if we do that, now it should be perfectly smooth. You can kind of still see the vertex line that goes cross where they joined up. Just give this just a moment here, and now it's perfectly smooth. I'm gonna go and do that to the others, but I'm just gonna skip past it so you guys do not have to watch that. All right, I've got all the other sections cleaned up now so that when they subdivide, there's no gap, and I've cleared the sharp mark on them, so it's smooth all the way around. and looks like a single piece. The only thing now we need to do is to export. But first, I also need to smooth these rings here. Now you'll notice that we cannot simply go over here and hit smooth on these, because the actual geometry is just the ring on the inside. We need to go over to the skin modifier and then toggle smooth shading there. And now they will appear smooth. So let's select our entire mesh, go to file, and then export FBX. I've already done this once to make sure a thing was right and it remembered my settings. The settings I'm using is selected objects on main and have mesh toggled on here since we just care about the mesh information. I've also gone to geometries and do apply modifiers and then use modifier render settings. You remember that I have set my subdivision surface to be number two on render. So if I click on one of these meshes here, then go to subserve, the render says two. So that way it's going to set all these once more on export. We're going to be baking these out as a 4K texture, even though we will never use that in a game. We're going to downscale the 2K or 1K for in-game use, but I always do it at a very high resolution, so that way I can downscale, because you can't simply upscale resolution very easily. So, looks like everything is smooth. Select all, go to file, then export, and use the settings that it's specified and then do export tube underscore high. This is the high poly. Right high, and then let's do export. Now this is going to take just a few minutes, five to 10. It can take a lot longer if your computer is not quite beefy enough to be handling all these polygons. So I'm going to stop the recording and come back when that's done and then also export the low poly. I'll be exporting at the low poly with the exact same settings. All right, my high poly finally exported after about three to four minutes of processing time. I also went ahead and exported out my low poly after smoothing the shading on it. Now I'm gonna tab over the Marmoset tool bag where we'll be doing our baking. Now you're welcome to do your baking in any program you prefer. I just like Marmoset tool bags baking a lot. So I'm going to go ahead and open up a window that has my models on it, and I'm just gonna drag over the low poly first. We'll drag over the high poly in a moment, but it's gonna take a long time to import the high poly because of its high polygon count. It should take quite a few moments. It looks like it has some extra ones in here when I was testing out the importing on here. So I'm just gonna go delete those. So first thing you're gonna to want to do is go to the top here and you see this bread icon, and that's for the baker. So we're going to add that, and then we're gonna drag our inside tube and score low right below the low inside here. Now, if we click the low here, we can see we have options for cages and a few other settings, but we weren't going to look at that just yet. I'm gonna to go to the baker here and look at the resolution and other settings. 
So I'm going to go ahead and change the sampling to 16 times and then change the format to 16 bits. So we have more information and it will be much more detailed normal map. It will be nice and smooth. I'm also going to go ahead and configure what maps I would like to bake. I know I'm going to want to bake a normals map and I also know I'm going to want to get an ambient occlusion map. But that's not that important. We're also going to get a height and the ambient occlusion here. And you're welcome to bake out quite a few other maps here depending on what you want to be working with. We're going to be taking these big maps over into Substance Designer. So things like curvature are also very nice. Though you could bake out just a height map and get every single other map from that. But I'm going to just get the curvature and also the ambient occlusion in here. Simply because I know the bakes will be much higher quality than what I'll be able to produce inside of Substance Designer. Though Amy Inclusion is going to take a very long time to bake, so keep that in mind. Now we're ready to go ahead and import our high poly. So once again, I'm going to just go over to my window here and drag the model in. And this is going to take maybe five minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and come back once it's finished importing. All right, it imported. And to my surprise, it actually came in about 30 seconds. I remember it usually taking a lot longer than that. But we're ready to almost start the baking. You would notice that our high poly is here, and if we want to hide the low poly so we can see better, we can just go up here and check the little eyeball here on the low category, and that hides everything underneath that. Now we can see our model clearly, and you'll also notice that it imported our materials here. This is going to be useful for us because one other option I forgot to turn on my baker up here is baking out a matte ID. Now, I personally prefer to be able to choose exactly what color it is for my matte ID. And if we choose the matte ID baking op option here, it's actually going to just choose random colors for it. So something you can do to get around that if you really want to pick out what color you want to be is bake out an albedo and use that as your material ID. And then I can go over here and click on, say, the fabric and change it to a specific color I want. I'm going to change this to a bright solid red, and then I'm going to change the metal rings to a bright solid green. So let's put all these values to here. Move all the way up. Let's put the red at zero down here. Now these are solid green. Nice Christmas colors here that we're baking out. And next, we just need to drag our high poly under the high category. We're almost ready to bake. I just need to go and check my set, my cage here. So notice that when I click on the low here, I can see the cage distance for the rays. I need to make sure the high poly is completely inside this cage, otherwise it will clip. So here's a section we can see it's not inside. So if you go to the max offset option, you can just drag this out and view it in real time. But you don't want to go too extreme, just enough for what you need. All right. And sometimes it can take a long time after you adjust it the first time. I think it is trying to calculate for the quick bake, quick bake here. You can have it set to where it'll automatically bake every time you make an adjustment. Though sometimes you can just lag the whole system down. So I may cut the footage here and come back real quick, or not. It is finished. That's perfect. So let's just make sure it's actually encompassing everything else. It should be since these are all the same model, just kind of rotated and inverted. And yes, they are. So now I'm going to actually bake. And I'm going to go ahead and change the settings on some of my bakes here. I'm going to want to change the normals to have a flip Y for the DirectX format. And I believe everything else here is good. Now in any occlusion, you can up the quality quite a bit, all the way to 4096 ray counts. That can take a very long time to bake, especially if you're at 4K, take upwards of an hour to be baking something like that. So I don't recommend going quite that high. The defaults work just fine. And Albedo doesn't have any options. All right. Before I bake at 4K, I'm gonna put this down to 1K and bake and see how that looks. So if there's any obvious big issues, I can correct those before baking up the 4K since that's gonna take the longest. So we need to specify our output though. So click on these three dots here. And I have this inside my baking folder here. And I'm gonna set these to PNG. And then I'm gonna set it to be mm, the tube underscore texture bake. 
you can name this whatever you're making for your material. Just go to texture bake, hit save, and now it should put it there. And one other thing I'm going to do is turn off padding to none. Normally you'd want to do that if you're doing a lone model where the textures are not going to be tiling. But since we're making a tiling texture, we don't want to be expanding it out at all. So I'm going to hit the bake button and I'll come back when it's done. All right, the baking actually only took about 10 seconds, so it's very quick. Let's go ahead and take a look at our maps. So this is labeled the albedo, but this is actually what we're going to be using as our mat ID. Like I said before, I like to choose specifically what my colors are for the mat ID. That's why we did that. Let's go ahead and take a look at the next image. And here's the ambient occlusion. You can zoom in here a little bit to see how this looks. And it's a little grainy and fuzzy since we're just using the lowest default setting right now for the occlusion bake, but it all looks good here. I don't see any big obvious missing segments that we're probably going to have an issue once we reach our height map. I'll cover in just a moment. There's the curvature map. That all looks fine. And here's the height, and there's an issue. You can see the height just has these big black gas fields, so the rays just didn't go in far enough. And that's just one other setting we need to mess with now is go back to the Baker group, go down to the height, and toggle that on, and change the distance of how far in and out it's going. So if we take a look back at our height map, it looks like it's reaching the furthest amount out, maybe actually it's clipping there too. So we need to change this quite a bit. So I'm gonna change this to a value of 1.5 and then the inside to negative three. And I'm kind of just guessing here on how far out and inward it needs to go. But the goal is to kind of try somewhat close, but you're gonna to wanna to shoot over just a little bit because we can normalize it later. And you don't want to be so close to where it looks like you're getting the full range, but you're actually still clipping some. So I tried to go a bit generously on these options. Now if I go back to the baker and hit bake, it should re-export that. And something I should have done now is actually toggle everything off except height. Because now it's going to bake everything else, which will just take longer, but it's super quick at 1K. Let's take a look at our height now. It looks okay, but it looks like we're still missing quite a bit in there and maybe still clipping at the top here. So I'm going to ramp this up quite a bit. Let's go back to our height option here and let's put this at three and this at negative six. This is definitely more than we'll need and we'll just normalize it once we get into Substance Designer. So now let's bake this and then expect how it looks. And once again, I should have checked those off, but didn't. All right, so now we can view our height, and now we're definitely getting the entire range and then some, so we need to normalize it. But now we know our textures worked at baking out at 1K. So I'm gonna do a baker here and go and ramp this up to 4K and bake again. And I'm also gonna to go to the ambient occlusion and up the ray count to 1024. This will take substantially quite a bit longer to bake, maybe anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes though I may be over guessing. But I'm gonna hit bake and cut, and then we'll find out. All right, the baking has finally finished after about 22 minutes. 98% of the time was the ambient occlusion baking. If you see that it has a ray count setting on it, you can assume it's probably gonna take quite a while, especially at a high ray count and high resolution. Let's go ahead and take a look at our textures again and see how they look. So we have the albedo, or in our case, our matte ID here. And we have our ambient occlusion, which will look very nice now, It'll be very detailed. Now this is something we could have gotten inside of Substance Designer, but the bakes will usually turn out a much higher quality. Not to say that the quality you would generate in SD would not be good enough. All right, let's go and take a look at the next map. It should be the curvature here and this won't have any extreme detail in it. You can see that Windows Photo Viewer kind of freaks out at the resolution. So you can sometimes back up and see it again. But this will be used for as an input into generator masks inside of Substance Designer. That's a useful map to have. So I'm gonna close that and take a look at the height. And this looks very good too. Once again, you can back out again inside Windows Photo Viewer to fix that kind of disappearing problem. And let's just check the normal here real quick to make sure it's all good. 
And the reason I'm checking these again is that now that we're at 4K, this could have spotted small artifacts that we would not have noticed before at the 1K resolution. But everything looks good here too. So we're finally ready to move on to the final stage of this process in Inception Designer. So I'll meet you over there. So I'm inside Substance Designer now, and I went ahead and created a new graph using the template Metallic Roughness, which gave us a base color, normal, roughness, metallic, and height output. We'll also need to add an ambient occlusion output, and I'll do that a little bit later. The first thing I'm going to do is navigate over to where I export my baked maps and bring those in. I'm going to drop them in, hit Link Resources, and hit OK. And I'm going to go ahead and hit Yes here. I actually already imported them once. And so it's going to ask me for each one. I was doing a little bit of testing before I started the recording process, but now they're all in. So first thing I'm going to do is go over to the grayscale images and click them and then turn them to grayscale over here on the right. And the next thing I'm going to do is put in a grayscale conversion node after this. So I'm going to want to take my height and go ahead and auto level this and bring this to a solid black out here on the outside. And to do that, I'm going to be creating a mask based off of where the black is here. I'm going to convert to grayscale, add in a levels node, and then clamp this white bar all the way down. So now it's just solid white. And then I'm going to add in a blend. But before that, I need to add in a levels node here and then hit the auto level button right here in the upper right. So now it's been auto level once to get the full range. Now let's take this and multiply it. All right, we have our maps now how we want them. So something that was important for me to do with these is our in texture sheet, we normally have four of these going forth, but we're just making one today. So in the end, I might actually turn, use these inputs to make a full tiling material. But if you were to have, say, four of these here, making them tile roughness-wise and color-wise, whatever details we can, such as is easy on the vertical axis. But horizontally here, we need to figure out how to tell whenever something procedurally generates right off here and then continues right here. So to do that, I'm going to use some transformation tuning as you go ahead and move these over to the left and to the right on both sides. And I want to do it for all these at the same time rather than using a ton of transformation 2D nodes. So what I'm going to do is grab a transform material node. And I believe I just type in material to find it. Material transform. So we're going to want to plug in these inputs here, but there's actually a lot of inputs missing inside here. We don't have a diffuse or a base color. But I'm going to go ahead and keep the diffuse, keep the normal, disable specular, disable glossiness, roughness, metallic, and then we do have ambient occlusion and AO. The two additional maps we have is the ambient occlusion. That's not the additional map. The additional map is the curvature. So the curvature, there is no input on here for that, so we just need to use any grayscale input we want. So for that, I'm going to just use the specular slot since it's the highest one. So let's go ahead and move these around to where they are relative on here. So I'm going to put the matte ID into the diffuse since it needs to go into color. Up next is normal on the input. Let's go ahead and start putting this in. So matte ID, then normal. Then the next one wants the specter. So actually, specter's not grayscale. So I'm going to turn that off and then turn on glossiness. That's what I use for curvature. So glossiness, and here is our curvature bake. And if you click on one, you can see here on the resource path, it kind of tells you what name it is. You can quickly recognize it. Let's plug that into here. Move this down. Up next is the ambient occlusion, which is located here. And then finally, the height. And it's now how we have all these maps in the correct order and they're all crossing each other. So next what we're going to need to do is use a transformation material node. Let's type material again. And actually this is the material transform node, so we can just duplicate this. Before I do that, I'm going to move it to the left by 0.25. Let's do 0.25. And now it's there, and I'm going to duplicate this and I could just replug these maps into the blend node I'm going to do up ahead, but instead, to keep it quicker, I'm just going to put set zero. And the next one, I'm hitting Control D to duplicate these. 
I'm going to put this at negative 0.25. So you got 0.25, 0, negative 0.25. Now if I type material again, we should have a material blend somewhere around here. Here it is. And I'm going to keep these same apps I have enabled on here. So I had diffuse and then normal, no specter, I had glosses, no roughness, or metallic, had high dynamic occlusion. So that's one, two, three, four, five, one, three. So that's all five of them. So then I'm going to change this from standard to material mode up here in the upper left. So that way when I drag out all these, they just combine. So the way this material blend works is you would notice it's not adding them together right now. And there are some maps down here. I think the actual easiest way we can do this is plug in our mask here. And it's basically saying wherever the second input is, put where the mask is. And then everywhere else, just use the first input. So now it's actually combined them all together. So if I double click on one of the little dots here of the output, I can see what it's outputting. So the normal here looks good. Glossiness looks good. The image occlusion looks good. And the height looks good. All right. I'm going to duplicate this, combine this, all right. And I'm actually going to scratch that. I'm gonna move this down, move this up because I don't want to do math. What I'm going to do is keep that just the same, but I'm going to combine these two. And you'll see in a moment here why I'm doing this to be a little bit quicker. So for the mask on this one, I just need to add in a fill color node somewhere. There it is behind the one of the nodes. And then convert that to grayscale. And then make it solid white. And then I'm gonna add in a blend node. And I like to use blend nodes to crop things. There's a cropping area section here. So this is on the left side, so I know I can just put this at 0.5 here. And I said I wanted to, this is a little bit quicker for me because I wanted to think about where this exact line is positioned. I think it's at about 0.35 around there, or 0.375. But in any case, this blends them both together perfectly. So now they're added. The only thing I have to do now is just plug this in here and we're done. Or we are not right. I did unplug this mask. Let's go and plug that in. Okay. So I put diffuse this tiling, normal this is tiling, and so forth. And later on, if we want to combine this into a full material, we can also take these and slide them up and down so it doesn't look like they're matching so heavily. And we can do some other things that mix around, make it look so it's not tiling and repeating. But I'll get to that later on if we go down that route. For now, let's just focus on this as we're making a one-fourth trim. So with these all combined, I can later on stitch these together by moving them apart. So let's take, put this back into standard mode. And let's see, it's our normal and our height. So I think the first thing I'm gonna do is plug in some of these outputs over here. So I'm gonna plug in the height here. I need an aim at occlusion output. So if I go up here to the top and I hit this little arrow here since my screen's not big enough right now to be displaying all of it. I can find an output node. And likewise, you can just search for it. I'm going to go down to add item and change it to ambient occlusion. And I'm going to copy all of that and move it up here to the identifier. The identifier is what Substyle looks at in order to know the link things together when I'm using, say, material or compact material mode. So I'm going to go and plug in the ambient occlusion here. I want to plug in the normal into the normal slot up here. And then we don't have a roughness or anything else right now. And then for color, and also metallic, let's add another one. I'm going to grab in, I believe it's called color to mask. Here it is. I'm going to add in a second one. So I want to go ahead and mask out the colors here. So the easiest way to do this is to just double click the input on the color to mask, and now I can select our color. So I know I'm looking for a solid green one there, which this is by default, and the other one's just solid red. That's why we use this absolute value, so we can just easily find them by doing it mainly with the color pick. So now we've got those masks, and really I kind of only need one of them, but oh well. 
So let's take this color mask, which is for the bars here, and plug it into the bottom. And I'm going to go and use this to control the metallic. Let's add in a uniform color node, make it grayscale, then plug these both in. So for those white, we want it to be metal. Let's put it to the top. So these are all metal now, and really I can just use the mask here, so I don't know why I'm not doing that. Let's delete these and just plug the mask straight into the metallic. And then I can do view outputs in 3D just in case it's not outputting. And these are metallic now, it's kind of hard to see, so I'm going to add in a uniform color here. Plug that into base color, and then change it to a more kind of neutral gray color. And I'm going to slide things over here so you guys can have a better picture of the material. Alright, so now where it's supposed to be metal, it is, and the bake came out quite well. I can also go to Material, Default, Definitions, choose the Physical Metallic Roughness, then go to Tessellation, and I can tessellate a little bit to see how it's going to form. Alright, just a tad. And the height map came out very nicely. Usually if you have too, sh too sharp of a fall, it can go straight down, but everything has a nice transition there's no harsh fall offs so this would work very nice as a full material all right so next i'm going to add in a blend node up here and kind of add in the base mask for our color so i'm just going to use this mask plug that into opacity add two blend nodes and then add another blend node here and this one i'm going to keep a kind of neutral silver color and this one I think I want to be kind of a yellowish tan. Let's see how that looks. We also need to look into adding our roughness. So I'm going to make this a bit darker. And I'll kind of be experimenting and playing around here for what I want. But overall I'll be using a lot of different generators. So I'm going to start focusing on the main roughness here of the material. So I'm going to add on a blend, grab a clouds three or two. I'm going to mess around with these some. And then I'm also going to grab a gradient. Let's take this one and rotate it 90 degrees. I think what I'm gonna do for this is transform it first. Let's see. Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna transform it in a half but then I'm going to go up to the tiling here, change it to absolute, then only to vertical tiling. So that way there's a gap here between these. I'm going to add another transformation 2D node and change it to absolute H and V tiling. The tiling is always relative to what you have. So this is only doing vertical, which means this would have done vertical if I kept it like that. So now I can divide this a ton to a bunch of fine lines here. And I'm going to use this for adding to the roughness. What I like to do for basic roughness is add some sort of noise and add a histogram range. Yes, histogram range. I thought they might have changed the name of it in a later patch. But I can up the range here and let's put the roughness about here first and just see how that looks. And then I'm going to just duplicate that and put it in the bottom. All right. Actually, no, I don't want anything in the bottom. So let's put this as the roughness for now, as a kind of place we're going to build on it later for the plastic area. Add this as to roughness. And overall, the material should be pretty glossy. So let's invert this. Invert. And yeah, let's just check and see if there's an invert already on the node. All right and start doing this a little bit. I want this to be quite a bit finer. And I think I'm going to add in another clouds node here. Let's say clouds one. Take this, multiply, blend. Let's multiply these together, but multiply that half. I'm just doing that to break it up a little bit. All right. So now I'm going to up the range on this some. Let's bring it up, back up. Okay, is that something I like for now? Not really, no. Um, let's add in a levels node here at the end and let's auto level it. Then let's remove this curvature around a bit. I like these to be a bit sharper. So I want it to be kind of a mainly 
glossy, but then every now and then some much more glossier parts. Somewhat looking how I want it, but not quite. I think this just needs to be a lot finer. So let's swap these inputs. There we go. That's having that kind of nice roughness breakup I like. Like right there. Okay, that's quite a bit better. So let's see how this looks without that. And I'm going to go in before here and auto level it. Let's move these all back. It's here and then auto level it. That's not doing much. So I like that look a lot, quite a bit more for the kind of uniform base plasticky color. So now what I'm going to do is the glossiness is what has our curvature. So the best way I like to explore different curvature options is just type in edge. And you can find a bunch of different like edge spec one kind of edge wear units here. And most of them take curvature, some of them are also going to want ambient occlusion. So let's plug in our curvature here and see what kind of mass this generates. So there's the threshold sum. I like how it's placed in those kind of spots there. Move the level up and down. So that's up the level sum. What I may do is now blur this. And I'll just use a standard blur so you don't need super high quality. Let's put this at 0.2. Or 0.3. And I'll do 0.2. All right, then I'm going to add in a blend and then I'm going to add in another clouds. So I'm going to do clouds one this time. Scale it a little bit, plug it in, and multiply. So now that's only appearing on here. It's not as significant, but it adds a little bit of unique breakup to it. Now then I'm going to add another blend node here and plug that in as the mask. And then I'm going to add in a fill here, change it to color, and plug that in. And this is going to act as just a little bit of wear dust on corners and edges to kind of highlight them better. And I'm going to add that into the color also. So I'm going to add in the blend, take that same mask and put it into color, then move that up here. Right, and this actually does need to be color. So let's put this as some sort of kind of dark, nasty color. Let's see how that looks. It's very subtle, and that's fine, as we're going to add in even more. So let's go into look for another edgeware. I believe metal edgeware is something we can then blur and put another mask on. Let's check out the metal edgeware real quick. So this does require two more inputs to be used on 3D models, but we really don't care about this and it will work fine using just the aim and occlusion and curvature. Let's take the curvature from our glossiness and plug that in. And let's grab our ambient occlusion and plug that in. All right. Yes, I really like the look of this. This is a very nice and cool mask to generate. Let's mess with this some. I'm gonna make this, and I think I'm gonna go and plug it in and then mess with it see it kind of showing how it's to form the mask. So I'm going to do the same kind of similar setup. Add in this color node here, plug that in. Then let's plug in our mask there. All right. Then I'm going to add another blend here, another color, and just keep layering and layering and layering. The more you layer, the better it will be. Let's layer this on. And I'm going to want this to maybe be an overlay, but I'm not quite sure what I want with it yet. So let's move it down. I want it to be kind of a gray color. Let's do something like that, see how that looks right now. I kind of like that. It kind of looks like it's showing the color of the tube underneath it, behind the color, but only on the areas that are actually really pressed against it. A very nice effect. Well, let's see what happens. We kind of turn this to like a dark red to kind of show that more. Yeah, I think I may just keep that more of a neutral gray, maybe it's a slightish red tint. We can go back and play with these more later. But I do want something to highlight the edges, and I'll be adding curvature on top. I think that's usually a good way to do that. And we'll be getting to the metal bar soon, but these are very thin, so there's not going to be a crazy amount we're going to be adding to that. 
Um, let's see, what else do we have to change on this? I think I'm going to change the grunge amount and also the grunge scale to make it smaller. Let's kind of break it up more. Uh, let's put the grunge amount back down. So the grunge is kind of a time mask, it's multiplying on top. So I'm going to go ahead and add in the curvature multiplier to see how it makes things kind of pop out. Ideally, your base color looks flat, but I like to have some kind of highlights drawn and stuff like that to make it pop more. And a good way to do that, that I've learned while at Game Textures is to take curvature maps and multiply it on top. So I'm going to take the curvature and curvature smooth, and then we're going to go back and grab our normal map and plug those in. And I missed. Now I'm going to plug it in and grab the grab it again, plug it in. All right, this drawing has two different types of normal or curvature maps here. One's very kind of sharp and precise details. And then the other one is kind of very smooth. And this one really captures somewhat the shape of it. So what I'm going to do is convert both of these to color by plugging them into a gradient map. All right, and I may not use both of them. But what I do is just plug that in. I usually get this at the very end of the chain and then we can change it to overlay. So maybe not something quite that strong, but you can see it goes from being this flat to having a bit more kind of darkened crevices. It's good for giving the effect that there's actually dirt in the crevices here and that there's kind of chip and wear at the height points. It really does bring out the details and makes it much more easy to recognize from distance what things are. Point 0.4, let's keep it at say 0.45 for now. I'm really liking how this is looking so far. You may even add some color patterns or something later. Um, so I think what I'll do here is actually start working this as if it were a full material but I want to go ahead and show you guys or before I do that, if we were to just keep this as a one fourth trim and then add another one fourth here. So if you wanted to keep this as a one fourth trim and make sure it's tiling left and right just upon the one fourth here, realistically, you could go ahead and export out this and it wouldn't be that noticeable on the model if you had the seam turn inward towards a wall or something. Seams are usually quite visible on most games They're using tiling assets, so as long as the height to normal matches up, it won't be that visible. The only thing that won't be tiling perfectly is the color and the roughness. And if you have those really crazy colors, then yeah, it's going to be noticeable. But such a uniform color like this won't be that visible. So what I'm going to do is, let's go back to our Transform 2D node here. Hmm, right. So I think the best way I went about doing this was transforming things over by a fraction and then multiplying them on top. So let's do this. Let's grab one of these transform 2D nodes here from the very beginning. And I'm actually going to just chop all that. Actually, I'm going to delete the whole thing and add a new material transform over here. Let's type in material and let's go to material transform here. And I like to be able to grab my nodes here at the very end. So what I'll do sometimes is go ahead and add a levels node here. And this just as a organization tip to kind of slide things at the end. So I'm going to add one in for each and every output. One there, one here. Another one here. And then slide that back some. And just the last two. That's the wrong node. All right. And these will act as ways we can drag out and go further to kind of edit things for this example. Okay. So let's see. I've got my base color. I've got normal. I've got glossiness or. Actually, I've got roughness. 
I've got my tie and occlusion height and everything else can stay there. So let's go ahead and plug these in and they're all should be in order. Yes, they are. So metallic and then the ambient occlusion and then the height. So now I'm also going to add another levels node and grab that mass from the very beginning. And another way you can add these placeholders is I believe you're holding control alt or shift alt. Yeah. If you hold down shift alt, you can see these little yellow bars here and you can grab these and pull them out. But if I remember correctly, they don't hover perfectly without and the yeah. So I like it that it's be able to stay stationary there in one place, but they just don't do that. All right. Let's add this mask right here and we're going to multiply that in a moment at the very end here. So our points that we want to actually tile are right here. So anything that comes off this left side here needs to also be here. So what we're going to do is I'm going to add in a shape node and I'm going to scale this down. And next I'm going to add in a transform 2D node. And I'm going to turn the tiling off on this for now. We're just going to mirror it. And I want this is the center of this to be directly in the center of these edges here. So it's not 0.25 because that would be a full mover. So it's half a 0.25, which is 0.125. Yes, that's correct. Uh, so let's put this by 0.125. And if we compare here, this should be directly on the dot now. And is it? Actually, I think I might have mapped that wrong. You can just add it here to, real quick to check. Or let's do a max light would be better. So, or I can actually just double click this and just left click this once. And okay, yeah, it is lining up perfectly. This our center of our transform to node is directly on the edge of this. But if you say so double click this, it shows in the viewport here. You can just left click only once here to see this. It just kind of looked a bit odd to my brain there. All right, I'm gonna make this a little bit skinnier. So now we're going to add in, actually this is the material transform we care about. So I'm going to move this to where the right side and the left side match up perfectly the same. So I've got say, the right side here clipping off. I'm going to take that entire section, move over 0.25, then add it again right here. So they're both the same on both sides. So let's take this and move it in any direction we want by 0.25. That's 0.25. All right. And actually, the direction does matter a little bit because we don't want to be adding on both sides. So if I want the right side here to be on the left side, then I need to move it by positive 0.25, which means the right side stays the same. So then we're going to grab that big material blend. And I'm going to add in a new one since all the inputs are named on that incorrectly. Let's do a material blend. I get this gigantic note here. Let's turn the diffuse off, keep base color normal, turn spectacle off, turn glossiness off, keep roughness and talent height, turn the occlusion off. All right. So we want the original to still be what we're outputting here. So I'm going to just grab all of these and plug them in. And then the occlusion and height, and then the metallic goes here. And the roughness goes there, the normal, and the base color. And then what I'm adding is this addition here. So let's take a look here and turn this into material mode to drag these all in. And I already have this move over to the left here. So I'm going to plug that in right here. I'm going to add a blur HQ. All right, keep the quiet one, though it doesn't feel like it's making a difference. I'm just keep it zero, I guess. So it's very hard to see here, but let's go ahead and add something like a very harsh noise onto here, just so we can see what's going on here better. 
and I think it should be working right now. I'm not wrong. This is just something extreme here. We're not going to keep, but it's just to kind of show you what's going on here. Uh, there we are. It's a very big splotch. So we can see now with our base color, or our base color here, it's not tiling right here on the one fourth mark here. So this big splotch isn't also right on the big splotch. So what I did here is take anything here and move it over one fourth, so 0.25 units, and then place it all right here. That should be what we have here. And yes, we do. So you can kind of see what the tile looks like here. Right here, right here, right here, right here, right here, right here. And that's how you can do a basic one fourth tile. I didn't have any big harsh colors, so it's not noticeable that there's this kind of fading blending here, which you can mess with some more. But now if I were to say, take that output and multiply, which I think there might be a good way to do that using the material blend here. I might be able to plug in as a mask. Let's try that real quick. So I'm gonna hit Control D on this, grab all the, just the noodles here and hit backspace or delete. And then I'm gonna plug this into the top and say I only want it to exist in the center here. Let's plug it as the grayscale map. And that's perfect. This is all tiling nice and neat now. You can see right where this falls off, it starts over here. Same thing as a little splotch here and here. So that's how you can do a one fourth tile. It's very, very nice for these. And at the end, you would just export these out or keep it right here in another subgraph and then add in three more here. Use a transform, say to put this one here put another one here and put another one here. And that's how to construct those trim sheets. But that is not what we are going to do for this one now. I'm gonna turn this into a full material now instead. So I something a bit more to work with. Uh, why can't I grab all these? I'm gonna move all these back to give a little bit more room. So in order to do this as a full material, and let me get rid of my black ink here. I want to have these all occurring by one fourth, but you can see there's this repeating and tiling here. So I could slide these up and down, but then they won't match truly perfectly here. But we might be able to slowly blend between these. So next up, let's start on that. All right, I'm back. And something I did between last segment and this segment is I went back to my input nodes here and I double click them, then change all their inputs from absolute to relative to parent. And now with the relative to parent, you just change the parent size here. The reason I did this is because calculation time is taking extremely long when editing these transform nodes for the next segment. And it took a long time for these to convert from absolute to relative. So something we probably should have done a lot earlier before working on. But now we can just change the resolution here. And with that lower resolution, we should be able to edit these much quicker. So what I'm gonna do here is take this node here, but then delete everything else here, almost everything else here. I wanna move these initial nodes back. Let's just click this one, hit delete. All right, you can see it's still taking quite a while, even at 1024, so we may go even lower than this. And let's delete this one here. Okay, so I'm first gonna convert this into a full tiling structure. So let's move this up a little bit here. So I'm gonna place this first one at the very far left. That's at 0.125, and 0.5 is too high, so we need to move it just half of 0.25 more. So let's add on an additional 0.125 to this already 0.25. So that is 0.275 or 3.75. Yes, that is now perfectly aligned over here. So let's just duplicate this and then subtract that 0.125 or actually subtract 0.25 from this. So the 0.5 goes from here, so, five, so that goes to two and this goes to one, so that's at point 0.125. Then let's duplicate this whole structure down here, move it up here. 
I'm going to switch to material mode. Let's blend this in here, blend this in here. And to make sure we have the mask in the correct area, I'm going to add a transform 2D node and put it at 0.125, which is the same location as this one here. Plug in our mask and then plug that in here. And now everything here should be lining up. All right, perfect. Next, I'm going to duplicate this node and actually slide it over, delete all these, plug this into here. Let's put it at 0.5. And putting it at 0.5, move it directly where I want it to be. Perfect. So in this one, we can actually just use the right half. Let's add in a color node and one of these here. All right, that's something we're going to use later on for the roughness. Forgot about those. We'll get to that later. Let's go to add our uniform color here, turn that to grayscale and max out white, and then add in a blend node and do the cropping on the right to 0.5. And that's our mask for just the right side since it's now taking up the left half and there's the right half. Um, we need to move this up and I'm going to duplicate this again. Let's use the same settings, delete that, plug in the mask there then grab these and plug them into the bottom, plug these into the top. Now we have a full tiling structure here. And actually this snow should be down here. Let's go and plug this in here. And oh boy, it's gonna cause quite a bit of lag since it's kind of plugging into everything down the line. So I'm going to delete these, plug this one into the bottom. It's gonna cause a little bit of lag there that turns all the outputs and then plug this in one and down here. That's where we're gonna lag a little bit too again. All right, all these are plugged in. Now we have a full somewhat tiling material. It is tiling, but we don't like this tiling here. So now we need to fix that. Let's move this whole structure over to give us a bit more room to fix this tiling. I'm gonna move this structure down here and move these over a bit. I'm just trying to give me some breathing room right now see what I'm working with. So what I am going to do is, let's think here. Right, I think what I'm going to do is first create a few different line masks. So let's take this one as an example. So let's add in a blur and grab that. And this is gonna serve as a mask for us in a second here. And I'm gonna once again take down this parent size down to 512 so this will all run much more smoothly. And then we'll up res at the end. I'm going to grab my transform here and then plug these in. All right. And then I kind of wanna be seeing maybe the normal here. Eh, oh well. Let's hit space here to be viewing this. And I want this to be at zero and I'm going to move this up by 0.5. Now what's important about this is the green line is the same spot where the metal is but everywhere else we can kind of edit that quite a bit. So let's move this one up by say 0.5 and I'm also going to rotate it by 180 degrees. Now let's add in our blend here. All right, delete these, plug this in as the original, and this one as the new. Then we just need to add in our mask where we want it. And let's see how this looks. Any harsh lines? There shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. These all look like they are repeating here, which they shouldn't be. Let's go up to normal here. So what's the normal look like on this? Oh no, it was doing something different. Uh, these two just kind of look similar. Um, let's grab this and move it by actually just zero. So full 180 flip, there we go. That's a bit more broken up, not as much as I would like. So let's just play with moving this some. Um, so let's do a negative 
there. That's a better breakup that I like. So as you can see, it is blending between these two slightly, but it's not a, an extremely noticeable amount. It just looks like there's still cloth on top of it. So let's keep on doing this process again so we can break it up even more. All right. And what I think I'm going to do to make this easier to manage the in her, I'll get to that later, how we're going to fix this whole noodle mess. Um, actually, I should probably do that now before it gets too hairy. Let's see. This is a material add. Let's add this in as the kind of final swath. Or, notice how can I fix this? Right, I know. I'm going to hit Control D on this. Move this way down, and then delete these sections. Problem is at the end, I was going to have to disconnect each of these, then rejoin them, and that was going to be a pain. So let's just have this as our final combine we're heading towards here at the end. Now I'm going to just delete these, and we'll eventually get to this point here, then it'll just automatically all link up. And everything will be nice and tidy. Right, let's go back to our normal here. You might be able to see on the Amit Occlusion channel too. So now we just need to mix up these one fourth ones a little bit more. So I am going to take this structure here and then make this to be one fourth. So let's put this at 0.25, right? And then let's add just in, you can just duplicate the same transform TD node and move it around some more. So let's put this at 0.5 and then add in our new material blend. All right, close that down. Combine all these into here. Combine these into the top. We can add in our new mask, which this is not right. So this should be at 0.75. Okay, cool. Let's plug that in there. How's this look right now? It's a bit more better broken up here. So this, this is the only segment here that really is showing the repeat, this and that. So I should try flipping this by 180. So let's flip this by 180. And then I think what I'm going to do is slide it on X some. There we go. So sliding on X is also a good way to help break this up some more. Okay, so now the last one is the one fourth over here. So once again, I'm gonna duplicate this structure. Let's all match these into the grid here. And then I'm gonna put this at 0.25 now for right. Actually, I'm gonna put that at one and put left at 0.25. There we are. And then a, another material blend here. Add this in here, put this in the bottom, and then duplicate this structure here, and put it at the top, and then let's add this in here and see how it looks. Probably need to mess around with some, maybe. Yes, we do. So let's slide it up some, and remember when we do on Y, it needs to be in 0.25 intervals, let's put this at zero. And then let's slide on X a little bit, or let's do a little bit in the other direction. So how about right here? That's nowhere. Hmm. I'm not sure this isn't tiling too much. So currently these are the same. And this really is kind of a cherry picking process. Just kind of messing around so we can get. Let's go ahead and put this at something different and then slide it by 0.25 intervals. There we go, that's a little bit better. At least I'm having trouble seeing some of the patterns. I see that these are kind of repeating the same, and same thing here. I'm gonna rotate this by 180 again. See what that gets us. 
All right, they're gonna be that way no matter what, though. Actually, it's the way we baked this out. This isn't that bad, though. I just slide up some of this a little bit more. Let's see which one is the biggest offender. This one we're even blurred now. It's this first one. So what about this if I move this first one along X some? Let's go ahead and double click on this normal output here so we're viewing that here. And then let's slide this first one kind of left and right some. Let's move that over here. Yeah, that's a lot better. All right, this is to a point to where I am not able to quite as easily recognize the tiling. It's actually pretty difficult to see where it is. And especially with the more color we're gonna be adding to it, this won't be as visible. So that's really nice in that we really only had to model and bake out one sixteenth of this entire structure here. We just baked this one small segment in Marvel Design at the beginning, and we created this entire tiling material based on that small input. Very nice. So now, since I have this at the very end here, I can actually, let's plug this into here, then move these outputs. This is not the final node here, this is the final node. So we need to put this one into here, and let it think for a second. So it's loading the inputs, and then load this one into here. And once again, let it think some. All right, neat. So I'm quite a bit happier with that. There's some tiling elements here I'm not too happy about right now. How am I going to fix that? It's kind of these center segments here. So once again, this one, let's try putting this at positive five. and see if that makes it any better. Let it think here for a second. I may change down the parent size down to 256 out of this since it looks like it's taking quite a bit longer to calculate now we have it fully plugged in. And that's because it's calculating all the nodes afterwards. So you have to be careful about that. And if you still haven't switched down from 4K, then it's definitely probably killing your computer. And oh boy, I'm gonna cut here real quick and then maybe it'll fix itself. Okay, I am back, and it really did not like what I did there, and I'm honestly not too sure why. It might have to do that I'm recording right now. I don't use substance sound a lot while I'm recording, so performance may be dragged. So I'm going to do an attempt to maybe make this run a little bit smoother in case that is a problem. And so I'm going to go over here, and let's try and just duplicate this with Control d and move it up. So I'm going to move this one down and just chop all these off with backspace. Okay, yes, good. It actually didn't, didn't take, you know, 30 minutes to calculate all that. So now when I edit anything here and check it, it's not going to go and into all these nodes, which there really is not much there. It's probably one of these has a large calculation time on it. I'm just not sure which one might be this stuff we have at the end here. Um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and chop all these off too. So we aren't using these anymore since so we're doing a full material now. All right, so now let's use this in order to check how well our tongue is. And it's this column right here, I'm seeing it's the only ones are being left, so I just need to transform this once more there, and then I can be done with it. So let's add this transform here, and then let's make a new mask. So let's take this structure, move it here, if I can actually grab it. There we are. I'm going to move this back and duplicate. Feed the first one into the bottom slot. And yes, that's what I want to do. And then feed this into the top slot. And then my mask, I want to be on the second to left one fourth section. So that will be, move the right, no. So move the left. Actually, let me move this to the top input, and yes, now I can crop it how I want. So I'm going to move this by 
and then move the right to 0.5. All right, so now I can kind of use the sirs to control where my mask is. All right, I'm gonna blur that, and then can plug that into the mask. And then all I need to do is slide this up by some amount. So let's move it up to 0.5, and I may flip this one again. Yeah, let's move this on X2 a little bit. Let's check the norm, how the normal map looks now in here. Okay, I'm seeing these two elements. Are these repeating? Yes, they are. So let's take this and put it to 0.25. There we are. That's quite a bit better in terms of the tiling effect. Maybe we can move this down by another 0.25. Let's put this to 0.5. Okay, I think I like how that looks now. Yes, that's quite a bit better. So let's use this as our font now. And the way I should be able to swap these, I can hold down shift, and then left click these and just drag them over. And hopefully this isn't gonna cause a big lag fest. Oh, they didn't like that. I guess those all don't transform over inside material mode. So I'm gonna go to standard then shift click movies over. Then hold shift, drag the height over. So it doesn't work for multiple chains in material mode. So shift, drag the aim occlusion over. Shift, drag our glossy slot over. Shift, drag our normal slot over. And then shift and drag the diffuse over. All right, don't need you anymore since you're kind of uh, keeping them in place. And this looks a lot better now. Something else we could have done since the final press is really going to be a 2K output, as our original inputs were 4K, though I now have them relative parent, I could have scaled this up since this is this one section would have been 2048 pixels. So I could scale this whole structure up by using transform TD node on them and multiplying it by two. Since the bars are in the place to kind of hold the seams there, that would have been help break up the tiling more. Then I could have really made it easy to not make a look at styling, but this works for our purposes here. Let's go ahead and turn the tessellation back on. I had to close down stuff since I moment ago, so some of my settings have reset. All right, let's move that down. So this is looking more for how I want it to. Sometimes I will change the maps for the environments to kind of look around them. And we're going to play around some roughness and change the metal because we haven't really touched that yet. So this kind of looks like in the garage. I do like how this is looking though. If we want to, we can add stripes or some sort of color patterns just now that we have a full like tiling. So we can make any tiling pattern now multiply it on top. Make life quite a bit easier. All right, I'm just gonna scoot this back over to give us more room in the viewport for you guys to see. And then let's go to those lines we made. First, I'm going to organize this a little bit and I don't want those. All right, I think I have these more in place where I want them. Eh, close enough. All right, so let's take these lines here and I want to add these the roughness to plastic also. And this is a kind of roughness effect I've seen on a lot of plastic packaging where they have these horizontal lines going across it. I've seen on cardboard packaging. I don't quite know why some of the packaging has those on there. I'm assuming it's related to the creation process of the material. That's an interesting effect that I really like. So I'm probably gonna bump this parent size up to 1024 now. Hopefully that won't kill things. Yeah, it's running buttery smooth now. Um, let's plug this into, I guess we'll do opacity. And I can take the same range here, even though it has some noise and just move the position really high up. Let's put this in here. No, not there, right here. There we go. And I'm gonna change this to, how does the overlay look? Eh, maybe. Let's do max lighten. I'll do it for most of the material there then. And it's probably hard to see right now. Let me see if I can pick it up at all. I'm having trouble seeing it. Or I can see it. I do want it to be a subtle effect. 
So let's move this position up more. Maybe not quite that high. Yeah, I do like the effect. Let me change the parent size to 248 now. I'm probably not going to go any higher than this unless I want to export at 4K. Let's make this divide once more to make the lines even thinner. Okay, yes, I really like that now. You can see all these kind of nice lines going across it. It's a very uh, nice factory look to it, a very constructive material. So I think for now, I'll call it done for the plastic part of this, but we still need to work with the metal here and we don't have to do that much with it because it's very tiny on the material. There's not much we can do with it. So I'm going to, in the next section here, let me collect all these and move them around to where they're making effects. So I'm gonna keep these down here. These are kind of our masks being generated. And this whole section here is just for plastic roughness. So I'm gonna put that inside a box here. We call it the plastic underscore roughness. And I kind of just add underscores out of the instinct now. It's a place of spaces. Some file systems like things have underscores rather than spaces, they can't recognize it. But you don't need to do that. Um, right, so we need to go to our masks, our metal masks which I thought I had some placed around here. Oh, they're right here. Let's probably name these. Let's put one here and call these masks. These are kind of masks down here too. So we have our metal mask here. So let's take this one, if I can click on it, and then plug it in for here. And then we are going to look up some noise. I want to grab a few ones here. I'm going to grab the isotropic. I know there's a directional noise I like. Yes, these I like using for metals. I scale them down quite small. I might take a look at some others. I might scale this more using the transform 2D node, make it really fine. And then I'm going to use the histogram range. Let's go and plug that in to see how it looks. You know, you really can't make that out much. I mean, it's so thin. It kind of already looks pretty nice there. I do like how that looks already. Let's move this up and down a little bit. Yeah, I like that effect. Let me inspect the roughness map and just see how it looks. So maybe what I'll do now is just add a grunge to that. Some sort of grunge to kind of overlay, maybe blur a bit just to give a little bit of variation to the values. Um, let's plug it in afterwards and maybe do an overlay. Right, let's do overlay and let's move the opacity down. Okay, let's just do multiply. Uh, I don't like how it's looking. Let's go back to overlay. And I think I will keep that. I mean, like I said, there's a very small portion of the material of these metal bars here, so they don't really matter that much. But we essentially have, have this how we want it now. And I think we can call that essentially done for this tutorial in terms of how to we went down and make a full material route with it, but we would have done a lot, been a lot, done a lot earlier if we did not go down this full material route, that's for sure. Okay. So thank you guys for watching and be sure to check out some of the other materials we've made using this method of game textures. And I'll have links in the bottom. All right, thank you.